I've come to the end of my Moorish spice journey and I'm really saddened. I've had a ball. I've seen everything Morocco has to offer and travelled all through Andalusia. As the Christians drove the Moors out of Spain, Granada was one of the last cities to fall. And to this day, it's one of the most magnificent in all of Andalusia. And later on, I leave the mountains and head to the coast to finish my spice journey in a beautiful seaside town. It's the middle of the day. It is, yes. <laughs> first wine or the first beer, it's here. Now I'm at the end of my Andalusian spice journey. I've got heaps of ideas, but I can only choose three. Order in. Boy. As the sun set on the final days of the Moorish Empire in Spain, Many people took refuge in the mountain region surrounding Granada. After the Moors were pushed back and eventually pushed out of Spain, right here in Granada was their last stand. For my final days in Spain, I'm beginning in the mountain city of Granada before heading across to Antequera, then onto the Mediterranean coastal city of Malaga. Whilst the Christians were reclaiming the rest of Spain, Granada was largely left alone. And the Moorish dynasty that ruled this city-state built one of the most magnificent palaces in all of Andalusia. The Sultan spent an absolute fortune beautifying the city, turning the Red Palace or the Alhambra into the most prized jewel in all of Andalusia. Eventually, the tide of history overcame the ruling Sultan and he surrendered the city to the Christians in 1492. The Moorish Empire in Spain was no more. Their legacy, though, is unmistakable, especially in the cuisine. For centuries, the keepers of these traditions have been women. So I've headed to El Ladrillo, a tapas bar where Incarni the cook serves up Moorish dishes that have stood the test of time. Hola. Hi. You know, there's a, um, there's a couple of dishes I've been eating the whole time I've been here in Granada. Really simple tapas style things, but I can really see the Moorish DNA. One's a pickled shark, um, simply fried, and the other one's fried eggplant with kind of like a treacle or a molasses on there. Really, really tasty. They're two of her specialties, and uh, I'm hoping she can show me her secret. Well, entonces, este es el cazón. Un poco de vinagre. To this local shark, Incarni adds salt and some bay leaves. Limon. Ajo. Machacao. And finally, some pimenton and dried oregano. Agua. Okay. Poquita. Look, up until this point, it's all about just getting flavour into the shark. Shark hasn't got a big flavour, so the more help you can give it, the better. And you're also trying to pickle it and preserve it. Este. Tiene que macerar por lo menos 24 horas. Pero tengo uno hecho que lo vamos a, a freír. Esto se tiene que abrir. Que abrir que se pega. Como está alineado, se pega. For the Moors, this process of curing fish allowed it to be transported all the way from the coast to Granada. Yeah. Yeah, it smells good. Yeah. yeah. It's then simply served on a bed of dressed iceberg lettuce. Ahí, prueba. ¿Qué dices? Te meto con la pala. Fried fish is always going to be good. It's, re <coughs> it's really hot. <laughs> and you can smell it straight away. So as, soon as, you, as soon as it goes in, you can smell the vinegar and the spices. It's really crunchy and tasty. It's a good one. I could budget these all day, but um, while I'm eating it, can you please show me how to make the eggplant? Chef, please. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Okay. <laughs> I love these classic home style dishes. And this one begins by soaking finely sliced eggplant in some water and milk. So, why do you put milk in there? Vamos a ver. Porque hay que echarle leche. Porque suelta negro. Keeps it white. Blanquita. Mm -hmm. It's then lightly tossed through flour. Yeah, mira que dorada. Perfecto. Ala. Over the top, a type of Andalusian molasses is drizzled over the fried eggplant. Oh. 
I've been eating this all through, you know, the, my, my trip in Spain in little bars and tapas bars. I reckon that's a winner. It's so simple, but it's so tasty. You eat one. Yep. Yep. Oh, baby. <laughs> Recipes like this, although simple, are like eating a slice of history. I think I can draw on that wisdom to create something totally new, but with roots that stretch back to the moors, thanks to Incarne. But what I've made here is a real simple glaze of barbecue sauce and some sugarcane molasses. It's really easy, just some pork ribs, skin's been removed, I'm just going to base it with this sauce. So don't be shy, give them a really good base. Cover them up. It's over in the oven. Two hours, at least two hours, 140 degrees. And then when you pull them out, they're going to look like this. So the meat's pulled back off the bone. A lot of the fat has rendered off. Strain that off into a pot so you can smell the sugar in there caramelising. Just give it another squeeze of some of this molasses. And what this is going to do, it's going to create a glaze and then straight on the ribs and a blast in the oven, about 200 degrees for about 15 minutes to get them all sticky and golden. And there you go. They're the ones that have been sitting in the oven for about 10 minutes. And look how golden they are. They're really sticky. The other part of this dish is a fried eggplant salad that I'm going to serve with some smoked eggplant, similar to a baba ganoush. Now, th there's nothing different than this. It's exactly the same way that Incarni did it. The only thing is that I'm going to slice them a little bit thicker. So, just lightly floured, fry those up just in some hot veggie oil, just until they're golden brown. I'm going to make a salad dressing with the eggplant. So some diced shallots, and a few roasted and busted up almonds, a splash of sherry vinegar, a touch of olive oil, and of course, a little bit more of that molasses. I know most people would like that whole rib, <laughs> but <laughs> I reckon three ribs as a serve. Time to plate it up. Some of my smoked eggplant, some of these really beautiful glazed pork ribs, and over the top, some fried eggplant. And that's a pretty good take on the original. Some fried eggplant with sugar cane molasses and some sticky pork ribs. I've travelled across to one of Andalusia's most fertile regions, the hills surrounding the ancient town of Antequera. For a while now, Andalusia has been finding it hard to battle with the big Spanish cuisines from Basque and Catalan. But I'm about to meet someone who's got a knockout punch and going to put Andalusian food back where it should be. Charo Camona is one of the quiet achievers of the Andalusian culinary revival. For the past few years, she's been gathering recipes from older women in order to preserve this ancient knowledge. For Charo, good, tasty, home-style food is more important than trendy soils and foams. Hay señoras mayores que contacto con ellas, me voy a su casa y cocino con ellas. Una cosa es la receta escrita. No de la señora mayor está la sabiduría, está el alma de la receta. Intento aprenderlo. <laughs> Maybe some of the tricks that you've learnt from the old grandmothers you can show me so I can share it with the rest of the world. Lo que yo sé, lo transmito. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Es mejor, es mejor compartir. All right, let's start cooking. <laughs> Charo's restaurant, Arte Cocina, or Art of the Kitchen, operates out of the old servants' quarters in a 17th century mansion. Bueno, muy That's... bien. <laughs> Today, Charo is going to show me an ancient recipe favoured by local shepherds and hunters, braised mountain goat. So, Charo, whose um, recipe is this one? De hecho, es la que se cocinaba el cabrero, era el señor que tenía la, la piara de cabra, para él. Goat herders wasted nothing, and Charo begins by frying off garlic and the goat liver, before getting started on the rest of the goat meat. For the spice, Charo gently fries some pimenton. That's an interesting technique of slowly roasting and bringing out the flavour of the pimenton. A little bit of oil and just massaging the oil through and warming the spice before it goes into the stew. It's a plate with the sour of the farm. Tomillo, oregano, 
es planta normal aquí en el campo. Y ahora ponemos vinagre porque eh, el, el cabrero cuando se hacía esta comida utilizaba una cabra vieja con una, una carne con mucho sabor y utilizaba vinagre para disfrazar toda. Water is added, it's seasoned and it's Ahora. left to boil until the meat is tender. So it's been cooking for an hour or so. She's finished her lunch service. I've walked back in the kitchen and she's hiding things from me. Is there secrets in here? Oh. What's this? Eso es. Oh, the liver. Claro. And the and the garlic. Sí. The bread mixture, along with the liver and garlic that was cooked earlier, will form the basis for this sauce. And to it, Chara adds some stock from the pot before blitzing it in a blender. So few ingredients, but I can already see this is going to be amazing. Hemos quitado el hueso. So is this just potato? Un poquito de patata paja que hemos frito nosotros. Wow. Hemos frito con un aceite de oliva virgen extra. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's really good. All right. The meat's so soft. Oh. I know I always say the food I eat is good, but that's better than good. That's bloody good. <laughs> Not really any heat, but for some reason I'm sweating. I don't know if it's because I'm excited or because it's just good. It's really, really tasty. With the fried potatoes underneath, that is a winner. A winner. Thank you very much. Chefs like me spend a lot of time on the technical aspects of cooking, but there's so much knowledge out there, even from a humble goat herder. I really like the technique of thickening the sauce, and I think if I swap out the goat for some rabbit, I've got the makings of a great new dish. All the flavours that I was cooking with charro really spoke to me of spring, and for me, there's no greater meat in spring than rabbit. Now, these are farmed, they're sustainable, they haven't got a lot of fat, and they taste really good. Inside the rabbit, you always get the kidneys, which are great, because we're going to need those for the sauce. The bit that I want off there for now is the belly flaps. I'm going to chop those up finely and fry them for my salad. Charo cooked everything on the bone, and the bone gives so much more flavour that I'm going to do the same as she did. I'm going to braise that and then pull the meat off. That's the nasty stuff done. Time to start cooking. Boy. Just like Charo, I begin by frying off some garlic, then the livers and kidneys. Take them out. And in that hot oil, we're going to quickly seal off our rabbit. Turn it around. You don't need much colour on it, you just want to seal it. Onions. Sliced up. Our spices. Some cinnamon. Bay leaves is torn. I'm putting a little bit of saffron powder and a heap of sweet paprika. That'll give that a good mix. Get all those flavours working. Now to give it the real sweetness, we're going to give it a really good hit of sherry vinegar. And when it's starting to really bubble rapidly, I'm going to give it enough water to cover. On with the lid. 45 minutes, just until that meat starts to come off the bone. As a side, I've prepped a fresh spring salad. And to it, I'm adding some floured deep fried rabbit belly and topping it with lemon and a splash of Spanish olive oil. That's a really fresh, tasty salad. All that's left to do is thicken the sauce. And then pick all that meat off the bone. This recipe gets thickened and flavoured with the livers that we cooked earlier and a little bit of the fried bread. As much of that sauce in there as you can fit. And then it's just a matter of pureeing it up. All right, there we go. This sauce needs to be mixed through the pulled rabbit. And then we're ready to serve. Now, I'm pretty happy with that. It looks really tasty. And I hope I haven't let down my new food hero, Charo. Her dish was great, but I hope this one does it some justice. So I've sadly come to the end of my Maori spice journey and it's landed me here in Malaga. It's a seaside town that sits right on the shores of the Mediterranean. And over the years, it's gathered a bit of reputation as an artistic spot. So I'm hoping some of that creativity could flow down into the food.
Malaga's balmy beachside climate infuses this city's culture and cuisine. I've met up with Alvaro Munoz, who heads up Gastro Arte, a group dedicated to promoting the wonders of Andalusian cuisine. Alvaro believes that every visitor to Malaga should do what the locals do, to start their afternoon with a cheeky sherry at Casa La Guardia, a bar that opened in 1840 in an old police station. Muchas gracias, Pepe. Gracias. Which one is this one? Yes. So, so the name is Pajarete. Pajarete. It's a type of uh, sweet wine. It's really so like the Pedro Jimenez. And... Yeah. It's a typical. Well, it looks like a busy place. Yeah. It's, a, it's the middle of the day. It's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody, and everybody's having the a drink. The first wine or the first beer is here. It's here. In Malaga. It's not just sherry. Beautiful seafood tapas are served up, including some amazing local clams. So what's this? This is concha fina, no? Concha fina. Mm. So these are still alive? Yeah. Ah, oh, look at that. Oh, so fresh. So fresh. You know? And that's the benefit of living in a, in a seaside town where mm -hmm. you're buying things from the market and the chefs are cooking with this amazing produce. It's always going to be a great cuisine. With only time for one restaurant in Malaga, Alvaro wants to take me to his favourite, La Cosmopolita. This is Shane. Nice to meet you. I hear that you're the best chef in Malaga. <laughs> Danny decided that he had enough of the cutthroat world of Michelin stars and was sick of keeping up with trends. He wanted to go back to his roots and breathe new life into old classics. And his croquetas are some of the best I've ever seen. Lo interesante de la croqueta es que quede crujiente por fuera y cuando lo apartamos. Oh, yeah. La cremosidad. Look how beautiful that is. It's so really creamy inside. It's almost a little a bubble of water. As soon as you touch it, it breaks. And that's exactly the characteristic you want to see. Estarán calientes. <laughs> really simple, but you know, it's always the simple things that I love the most, especially when they're cooked so well. That's great. With his experience, though, Danny has the wisdom to marry these classics with his creativity. And he wants to show me a dish that he thinks sums up Malaga, a kind of nose to tail surf and turf. Vamos a hacer ahora un tartar de gamba con tuétano asado, ¿de acuerdo? Tenemos la gamba, gamba fresca de aquí de Málaga, ¿de acuerdo? Fíjate qué maravilla. Looks great. El tuétano, que es la rodilla de la de la ternera, es una parte que por dentro es grasa y la acompañamos de una persilla de ajo y perejil, que es ajo, perejil y pan rallado, ¿de acuerdo? Danny starts by chopping the prawns roughly. No mucho más, ¿vale? Mm -hmm. A mí me gusta así. Le añadiremos aceite de oliva, un poquito de tabasco, limón y sal. Pues aproximadamente cinco minutos. Y ahora vamos a empezar a hacer el tuétano. ¿Vale? Danny has zapped the bone in the microwave, which cooks the marrow without dissolving it. And then over the top, he pours a bit of a gravy, which will act as a glaze. Y ahora lo metemos a la salamandra. Oh, that's going to be beautiful. Vale, y ahora, oh, donde yeah. esté <laughs> This is the food I love. I love it. Sí, no. <laughs> Mira, James. Oh, yeah. <laughs> vale. Yeah, it looks great. And with that, it's time to plate up. Con este pan, juntamos un poquito del tartar de gambas y un poquito del tuétano. Date cuenta, mira, James. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's crema. <laughs> this is, I know it's going to be good already. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> the bone marrow is really fatty, but yeah. it's almost like eating the best jamón. Okay. You know, like the... But it's really strong and clean, and the glaze on top adds a bit of charry and smokiness, and then the sweetness of the prawns with that little bit of acid from the lemon. It's a knockout. It's everything you want good tapa to be. You know, it's amazing food. That's great. That's great. This is a legend. <laughs> All of the food I've tried this week have been classic dishes done beautifully. They may not have been the prettiest, but they've damn sure been the tastiest. For me, I want to do both, and Danny's two dishes will be my inspiration. I've made a bechamel using flour, butter, milk, and prawn stock. To that, I'm going to add a little bit of squid ink, some diced shallots, some chives, 
and some prawn meat, which has just been chopped up. So that's raw. And already I'm using some of the flavors that Danny had with that prawn and bone marrow. That was such a good dish. So I'm just gonna put that in a bowl and put it in the fridge until it's set. All right, so that's been in the fridge for a few hours, preferably overnight, till it's nice and firm. It then needs to be formed in that classic croquette shape and rolled in flour. Danny's croquettes weren't so much about the casing and what it was fried in, it's all about that oozy bechamel in the middle. Just gently in some egg, and then from there, just into the breadcrumb. Just give it a good coat. Now I'm just gonna put those in the fridge for about 30 minutes minimum to set, and then they're going in the deep fryer. When Danny told me he was gonna cook the bone marrow in the microwave, I have to say, I was a little bit surprised. But when he told me why, it kind of made sense. When you roast bone marrow, you lose a lot of the bone marrow itself. When you do it like this, it kind of cooks the bone marrow but still keeps it together. That's just soft, just cooked. I'm gonna put them on my roasting tray, give them a little bit of sea salt and some nice thick beef jus. under salamander to get nice and crispy. Now we're talking. It's just like what Danny did. So the bones are all sticky, the jus all run off, it's got all the fat in there. And in this bowl, I've got a little bit of smashed up almonds, some diced shallots, a little bit of parsley. And to this, I'm adding diced tomatoes and some sourdough croutons. Some bone marrow. All this, the jus and the sauce, and this is the best bit. I'm just gonna break that up into chunks. Beautiful. That's the base ready. Now to deep fry the croquettes. I reckon that is spot on. Mega simple. I don't want to drape this all over the top of the croquettes because it's going to make them go soggy. Instead, I'm going to use it as a base. Doesn't need much more. Splash of colour. And that sums up Moorish food. Classic, creative, delicious. This journey has been a revelation to me. Beginning in Morocco, I discovered the culinary building blocks of a cuisine that has evolved from its African and Middle Eastern origins. The smell, it's pretty intense. The Andalusians have built on this Moorish heritage, but they haven't stood still, and the cuisine continues to evolve. Are we gonna dig in? Oh, I'm already there. <laughs> For me, this trip has allowed me to dig deep into our culinary history. The people who have preserved these recipes for centuries have given me the opportunity to invent new dishes that are contemporary, yet authentic. And in my own way, carry on these traditions for a whole new generation. And what's the verdict on my final three dishes? First up, inspired by Encarni's fried eggplant, is my sugar cane glazed pork ribs. Yeah, I love that. And there was like a potato or Yeah, a little, little smoked eggplant yeah, thing on the bottom. That was really nice. Second, Charo's approach to food was so inspiring. I've taken her ideas and added rabbit. The bunny was great, and I wouldn't normally say that. <laughs> Flavours are amazing. And finally, I've combined two of Danny's dishes into my prawn and squid ink croquette with roast bone marrow. I, I liked it, but I wouldn't probably order it. Okay. Well, there's nothing like finishing on a mixed review.